Well, good morning. It is especially good to see all of you this morning and as we have the opportunity together as a church family to witness a baptism. The Lord has given us this ordinance of baptism uh, to celebrate with one another. As we were to go to all nations and to make disciples, we are also to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. God has given us this ordinance as a gift, a way to visually see everything that happens when a person turns from their sin and puts their faith in Jesus Christ. It's a sign to us that we have been cleansed of all of our sins. It's also a sign to us that the old person has died. They are gone. When they go under the water, they're joined with Jesus Christ and they die with him. And when they come up, they have new life in Jesus Christ as well. We get to see that today in a way. We get to celebrate that today. I'd like to introduce you uh, to my friend, Jeff Brown. Jeff is gonna start making his way in here. Uh, many of you know the Waters family. This is Julie's dad, Jeff. Uh, you'll know that just a few weeks ago, uh, Jeff lost his wife, uh, Millie, and uh, many of you attended that funeral together. But in the wake of that, Jeff, in discussion with his family, Jeff became a Christian a long time ago. All those realities of being cleansed from his sin happened for him a long time ago, but he was reminded that he has never actually been baptized as a way to symbolize all of those things that are true in his life and have been true in his life for a long time. And so he made the decision today, come on, step on further up here for me. He decided that it was finally time for him to make that decision that he made so long ago public for the world to see, to public, publicly confess that Jesus Christ is his Lord and his, is his Savior and has been for a long time. And so we're excited that you've made that decision today, Jeff. I have just a couple questions I want to ask you. Do you believe that Jesus Christ died to pay the price for your I sins? Do. And do you believe that after three days of being in the grave that he rose to new life? I do. And that in him you can have new life? I believe. Amen. It's because of that profession of faith, Jeff, that I'm going to baptize you, my brother. You can go ahead and turn this way. Go ahead, pinch your nose. Jeff, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let's take a picture of you. There you go. <laughs> All right. It's never too late to follow through with what the Lord has commanded, with what the Lord has given us, and it's always a blessing to see this sign, the symbol of faith that has been so true in Jeff's life for so long. And my prayer would be that if any of you are in the similar place as Jeff is, where you, you've been trusting in Christ for a while, uh, but you've not yet followed through yourself, and after his example, after the example of Jesus himself to be baptized, we can fill this baptistry up any time. And you can be welcomed in these waters anytime. We'd love to talk to you about what that means for you and for your life. I'd like to pray for us. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this sign and symbol that you have given us of baptism. That we get to witness together as a church family. That yet again, we get to see how you have miraculously worked in unseen ways in someone's life. Even so long ago. And God, you've given us such a blessing to be able to have a, a visual representation of what's happened. That we've been cleansed from our sins. Just as water cleans, the blood of Jesus has cleansed us from all sin. We no longer have to fear condemnation because of our misgivings, our faults, our failures. But we've been cleansed from that. We no longer have to live as that old man, but you have made that person die and raised to new life with Jesus Christ. And we've been united to him so that the life we now live, we live by faith in the Son of God who loved us, who died for us. Lord, I pray that our faith today would be encouraged by what we've seen and we'll be encouraged later by what we hear as well. We pray these things in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Good morning. It's good to see all of you this morning. I'm glad that you are here for worship on this little extra long weekend, isn't it? Memorial weekend. Hopefully when you came in, you got a a bulletin. If you want to grab that quickly, I want to go through some of these. Uh, They're important announcements for you to hear how you can be involved in the church, participate in things within the church body. Uh, Youth camp is coming up. That's always a very big event in the life of the church. I know we already have quite a few registered and signed up for that. If you are going to youth camp or wanting to go, make sure you sign up. You can do that online uh, and pay online, do all of that. Uh, But do sign up uh, quickly before we run out of room. Uh, For those of you who aren't going, though, maybe you would like to help and support uh, some of the students there. There's a couple ways that you can do that. Uh, One is at the Welcome Centers, there's a board set up for needs that we have. You could take one of the stickers off of the board. It it might say like a gift card to Walmart or Gordon Foods or I don't know. There's different things on there. You can pull that off, uh, purchase that, and bring it back to the church for us. That will help uh, with any cost for youth camp. But then also, every year we have kids who just simply cannot pay. Uh, to go to youth camp, and so we always offer them scholarships. Those scholarships are normally funded by you, uh, people who are willing to give a scholarship amount for youth camp. I know we have students who are already in need of those, and so maybe you would be able to do that. You could just uh, put money or a check in an envelope there that's in front of you, and you could just write on the envelope that it's for youth camp scholarships, and we'll make sure that that gets to students Uh, who are in need of support for youth camp. And so hopefully some of you will be able to to do that to help uh, those students. Also, we've been announcing this Barnabas project, which has been very encouraging. We've had a lot of people sign up to be an encourager in this, uh, but we still have need for some young adults who want to sign up. So please uh, sign up for that. Signups are available at either of the the welcome centers. Uh, And so hopefully you'll You'll do that as well. I think there's also a Google form online uh, that you can that you can fill out. And then also next week is graduation Sunday. There are things at the Welcome Centers. If you're a graduate of high school or of college, uh, if you would fill that out, get it to me or to Pastor Scott, so we know who's coming. We like to get a little gift uh, for for graduates, so we want to make sure that we have enough of those uh, next week for you. But that's that's next Sunday is graduation Sunday as well as next Sunday evening. You'll see in the bulletin is our cornhole tournament. We try to do this every year in June. Uh, You can sign up now for that. It's helpful just to know about how many people are coming, but you can also sign up uh, the day of. When you arrive, you can sign up, you and your partner, and we will have the bracket ready to go uh, really quickly so that the cornhole tournament go on. You do not have to play in the tournament to come. It's also just a fellowship time for everybody. Uh, There'll be a little bit of food there and drinks, so hopefully you can come and just enjoy a Sunday evening uh, together as a church family. It always is a a really good time. Then lastly, at the bottom of the bulletin, this is kind of a newer thing for us, but we're seeing it as a mission, as an outreach in our community to try to get to know more people. There's a race that takes place in Erie, Michigan uh, here on Saturday, June 8th. It's called the Race for the Kids. They've been doing it for a while. All the proceeds, all the money they make goes to families who have a child that faces a lot of uh, medical bills and issues. Um, It's always pretty well ran, but they asked us this year if we could come and help uh, with the race distributing water. So it's not going to be very difficult. We'll need people at the finish line handing out water to those who finish. We need people kind of in the middle of the race handing out water Hopefully the people in the middle of the race finish too, but if they only make it there, they can get some water, I guess, in the middle uh, as well. There's a lot of people who run the race, but there's there's also plenty who walk. Uh, You could also be a part of the race if you want. I know you can sign up uh, when you get there, but we will need about 10 to 15 people to help work that race. And so if you're interested in that, again, it'll be a pretty simple thing for us to do. There's signups at the Welcome Centers, both of them. Uh, sign up and we'll we'll get you more information about that but I know that we can do that rather rather easily we do want to go to the Word of God uh, this morning before we pray again and then have our time of fellowship we want to read from the book of Psalms 
chapter 36, verses 5 through 9 together this morning. It says, Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like the great deep. Man and beast, you save, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. And you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. <clears throat> in your light do we see light. Let's bow together. Let's pray again this morning. God, we thank you that in you is the fountain of life. God, too often we try to find life in other areas and other people. <clears throat> but God, this morning we're reminded once again that it's you who gives life. And we've come this morning to worship you, to praise you, to honor you. We've come this morning to hear from your word. We've come this morning knowing that we need to grow closer to you, and we trust that you will help us to do that through singing of songs as we do that together, reminded of the truths in the songs. We do that through the reading of your word, through prayer, and through hearing your word preached. And so, God, we ask that you would help us this morning in all of those areas. God, we want to, we want to praise you well. We want, as we sing these songs, that's part of it, we want to to worship you, the one who's worthy of worship alone. Nobody else is worthy of worship but, but you. And God, this week, I'm sure we've spent time praising people, praising a lot of different things. But this morning, we want that to be directed to you. We know that you're the <clears throat> giver of all good things that comes from you. And so, God, help us to worship you well this morning. God, I know there's many church family members away this week, we pray for them as well. We, we miss them uh, being here with us. Uh, so be with them, we ask. But God, again, in this room, during this next hour or so, allow us and help us to worship you the way that we ought to this morning, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's stand together before we sing together. We want to take time to fellowship uh, with one another. So take some time to find someone and welcome them to church this morning, all right? our captain for now the weak can say that they are strong in the strength that God has given with shield of faith and belt of truth 
will stand against the devil's lies. An army bold, whose battle cry is love, reaching out to those in darkness. of soul, but to rage against the captor, and with the soul that makes the wounded whole, we will fight with faith and valor, when faced with trials on every side, we know the outcome is secure, and Christ will have the prize for which he died. An inheritance of nation. Come see the cross where love and mercy meet as the Son of God is stricken. Then see his foes like must beneath his feet, for the conqueror has risen. And as the soul is rolled away, Christ emerges from the grave. This victory march continues till the day. Every eye and heart shall see. So, Spirit, come, strengthen every stride. Give grace for every hurdle. Faith to win the prize of a servant good and faithful. As saints of old still line the way, retelling triumphs of His grace. We hear their calls and hunger for the day when with Christ we stand in glory. As saints of old still line the way. Wonderful to see you this morning. It's Memorial Day weekend. And I get the privilege to read one of the best passages in Scripture. Galatians chapter 3, 7 through 14. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Amen. The great mystery of the gospel is that God, um, we are all out of sorts in sin, aren't we? But God has set us right in Jesus Christ. He has set us right by Jesus taking our curse upon us. And the amazing thing is he takes our curse and we get his blessing. And that's the wonderful truth of the gospel. That is the proclamation that Jesus Christ 
has redeemed us. 2,000 years ago on a tree outside of Calvary, the curse for the sins of the world was put upon a man, and then the blessing that was his is now proclaimed to the whole world to be received by faith. Let's pray together this morning, thanking our God for such a wonderful salvation that he's given to us, that Jesus has taken away the curse so that we can receive his blessing. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that while we were yet in our sins, you sent Jesus to take our curse upon himself, to take our shame and our guilt and, and everything that results in, from the fall. That everything that we are and fail to be in this world as sinners was given to Jesus. And he voluntarily took it upon himself because he wanted to come on a mission to save us from our sins. Not to condemn us, but that the world might be saved in and through him. All that we lack in ourselves is found in Jesus. All that we stand condemned under is redeemed for us and, and forgiven to us because of Jesus. Help us, Heavenly Father, to seek everything in Jesus our Lord. To receive him as you have delivered him over to us, as the Prince of Peace, the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Lamb of God who has taken away our sins and the sins of the whole world. Help us to believe upon him, to receive him as the great gift that he is, to follow him, to listen to his teachings, and to be changed into his image as you every day uh, change us so that we're not the people that we used to be or are, but every day we are more and more renewed after the image of God in true righteousness and holiness. We pray that you'd forgive us of our sins, help us to walk in your light, and uh, bless us today as we hear your word. Help us to hear and to receive your truth. Let it go deep in us and shape and fashion us in your likeness. For Jesus' sake alone we pray. Amen. Children's Church this day? Okay, I knew it was the last Sunday. And so, and so anyway, that was in my mind. All right, Children's Church is today. So uh, children four and five can go to Children's Church. Um, we'll also take up the offering during this song. So let's stand together. Let's worship the Lord and sing his praises. <laughs> the lamb in victory receive 
the price of our redemption see the father's plan unfold bringing many sons to glory grace on Well, if you have your Bibles, if you would, take them out now. There should be a Bible in front of you, if you don't have one with you. Take that one out, turn to Genesis 43, making our way through the story of Joseph, his life. Genesis 43. How many of you, this weekend have plans to get together with friends or family to eat? Nobody? Raise your hand. Seriously. Anybody got plans? Some of you do? Okay. None of you invited me? No. <laughs> That's not the purpose of this. <laughs> no. I invited my family over, and they're coming, and I slid underneath. Well, we got to rip my deck up, so that's really why I invited you there's work to do. I'm thankful they're coming to help me with that. I ask that seriously because uh, we have a party today that we're going to read about, a meal, a reunification, and a celebration. Now, the family's not firmly aware yet of what the celebration is, but they do enjoy the celebration, and that's where we will find ourselves as we get through chapter 43 together. You might recall last week, uh, Joseph's brothers went to Egypt to buy food. Unknowingly, they meet Joseph. They see Joseph. They do not know it's him, but he's the one in charge. He's the one who has to give them food. And what ends up happening is the brothers end up leaving Egypt with one less brother. Simeon is in jail, and they are instructed that they must go home. They must get their youngest brother and bring him back to Egypt. When that happens, Simeon will be freed from jail and they will get what they need. Now, when Joseph sent them off that first time, he also gave them uh, plenty of food for their family and he also returned their money back to them. Now, they didn't know that this was done for them. And in fact, it brought a lot of fear to them when they got home and realized that their money was with them. And they were scared to death to go back to Egypt because they didn't know what would happen. They didn't know uh, what would take place. And what we really looked at last week was, it was a tough sermon, honestly. I don't know if you thought about it much this week. I, I hope God reminded you of it often. But we saw how those brothers just lived with guilt. Just riddled with shame and guilt because of what they had done with Joseph. I mean, so much so that this is what they went to when they were having troubles in Egypt. They said, this is why God is doing this to us. It's because of what we had done to Joseph. We, we remember hearing his cries and we would do nothing about it. And so they were in a very difficult situation because they also knew that their dad was never going to allow Benjamin to leave. And he even told them so when they went home. No, this isn't going to happen. And so that's where we left off in the story. A very difficult place for 
the family and a lot of wonder of what is going to happen and what is going to take place. Now, you may think, and we might think, well, what the family's going to do, and we might not, we might not be too far off. They, the family might have thought, well, let's just chalk up Simeon as a loss. We got some food. Uh, hopefully this lasts the rest of the famine, and we'll be okay. You know, uh, Simeon can just stay off in Egypt. The fact is, we don't really know the time frame between chapter 42 and 43, but regardless of the time frame, what happens is we see God continuing to work in this family. And remember what God is doing. God is making them to be the family they should be, the people of God, because that is who they are. They are the church. And so God is molding them and shaping them through all of this difficulty, through all of this guilt, through all of this shame. That is what God is doing. God is, God is moving here. But I was reminded this week, and I think it's a good reminder for all of us, God is moving slowly here. <laughs> we don't like that. You don't like that. I don't like that. I don't like in my life things to necessarily move slowly. And especially when we're praying to God, God, help me here. God, I have this illness. God, we're having this trouble financially. God, I'm having this trouble at work. God, my kids, this, whatever it might be. We do not like when God moves slowly in those situations, but so often that's exactly how God moves. And God has been working in this family now for years, decades, very slow moving situation. But so often this is exactly what God still does for us. And I think the reason for that is pretty simple. It can be easy to change in action quickly. It is very difficult to change a heart quickly. Right? You can, you can tell me you've changed. And for a while maybe you change. But true colors show over time, don't they? There, there's a simple analogy to this that all of us have done. Dieting is a great analogy for a lot of things in Scripture. You do it Monday. You do it Tuesday. Wednesday lunch is difficult because everybody went out, and so you just ate whatever you want. Thursday, you're like, I messed up yesterday. Let's just throw it all out the window. And by the weekend, you're right back saying, this Monday. Right? What is that? Well, you changed your actions for a little bit, but you really didn't change. Right? And nothing really actually changed in your life. And it takes a lot of work for that to happen and take place. And for our hearts to be changed, God has to move them and work. And oftentimes it's slow. And for us, it can be painful. And that's what that family is going through. That is what this family is experiencing. And that's what we're going to continue to kind of see in Genesis 43. So let's do what we've been doing. We read it in sections, talk about the section and move on. And at the end, see what God has for us. So let's read first the first 15 verses of chapter 43. It says, Now the famine was severe in the land. And when they had eaten the grain that they had bought, brought from Egypt, their father said to them, Go again, buy us a little food. But Judah said to him, The man solemnly warned us, saying, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you will send our brother with us, we will go down and buy you food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. Israel said, Why do you treat me so badly? as to tell me, to tell the man that you had another brother. They replied, The man questioned us carefully about ourselves and our kindred, saying, Is your father still alive? Do you have another brother? What we told him was an answer to these questions. Could we in any way know that he would say, Bring your brother down? And Judah said to Israel his father, Send the boy with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die both we and you and also our little ones. I will be a pledge of his safety. For my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set, set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. If we had not delayed, we would now have returned twice. Then their father Israel said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take some of the choice fruits of the land in your bags and carry a present down to the man. A little balm, a little honey, 
gum, myrrh, pistachio nuts, and almonds. Take double the money with you. Carry back with you the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. Take also your brother and arise, go again to the man. May God Almighty grant you mercy before the man. And may he send back your other brother and Benjamin. And as for me, if I am bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. So the men took this present, and they took double the money with them, and Benjamin, they arose, and they went down to Egypt and stood before Joseph. So right away, we see here in Genesis chapter 43 that the famine didn't end. It says the famine was actually very severe at this time, and it was crushing. Any hope of the famine ending was just out of, out of sight. There, there was no other option. They have to go back to Egypt, right? They, they have to go back and get food. Now, as I said before, we might think this family would just say, well, sorry, Simeon, you're a goner now. I would like to think that's not the case. I would like to think that always they had a plan to go back and to get him. We're not told that necessarily, but you would hope that. But we see Jacob struggle here, don't we, with the truth. Jacob is struggling greatly with the situation and everything that has taken place. He looks at his family, he looks at his life, he looks at his surroundings, he looks at everything that is happening, and he finally declares, you have to go back. You have to go back. And you have to get a sense here that the kids have been telling him this, because Judah's response to him towards the end was, we could have went and been back two times by now, right? But they've been delayed. They've been delayed. Because their dad obviously kept saying, no, 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 no. And it was putting quite a strain on the family. But now Jacob sees everything that is going on. He knows there is no hope for them in the land that they are in, in Canaan. And so he says, go. But when he says go, Judah speaks up, doesn't he? And Judah says, dad, you know we can't just go. <laughs> you know it's not, just these, not so simple as if we're going to the corner picking up some food, and bringing it home. You know what the man said. He said, we have to bring Benjamin. He said there was no point to come back unless we bring Benjamin with us. And so Judah is laying out the truce to his father, Jacob, who interestingly, in this chapter, is always called Israel. His name bounces back and forth to Jacob and Israel, because you remember God changed his name to Israel, a long time ago, and with all the other biblical characters who have a name change, you hear their name changed all the time, but not with Jacob. But here it goes to Israel, and so that's who's being talked about here. Jacob is struggling with this situation. And notice what he tries to do. Jacob tries to blame the sons for all that is happening. He says, you've put me in this situation. Why in the world would you tell that guy about your brother? He's shifting blame to them. He's got to blame somebody. We've been in those situations before, haven't we? He has to blame somebody. And so he's looking at Judah, and he's like, why would he even tell them? And I kind of like Judah's attitude here. This would kind of be my attitude. I'd be like, Dad, the guy asked us, do you have a dad? Yes. Is he alive? Yes. Do you have any other brothers? Well, these are all our brothers, so we do have one other brother at home. How would I know he would say, hey, you need to bring your youngest here. How was, he, how was I supposed to know that, Dad? Right? That, that, I couldn't even fathom that that would take place. So kind of what Judah is telling his dad here is, you can't blame us for this situation. When in reality, you could blame them. He just wasn't being blamed for the right thing. Right? But Judah's telling him, listen, this, this has to be done this way. You see, Judah comes back into the spotlight in this chapter, and it's important because he needs to be in the spotlight, and he will be in the spotlight as we continue on in this story. But finally, Judah steps up as a leader in this family. You might recall Reuben tried to last week, and his dad would have nothing to do with it. Reuben had lost his spot because of sin in his life before. Well, now at this time, it's, it's Judah. Judah comes to his dad. It's Judah who talks to his dad. And interestingly enough, it is Judah who's willing to sacrifice his life for Benjamin. And not just Benjamin. Judah's willing to sacrifice his life for the family at this moment. 
Because he tells his dad, dad, put my life down. Here it says as a promise, but another word would be as surety. I'm the collateral. I am what, I'm putting me on the line. And if I don't bring Judah, or if I don't bring Benjamin back home, then I will be guilty forever. He's, he's putting it all on him. This is, this is a big difference from the Judah of chapter 38, if you were here for that sermon, when he slept with his daughter-in-law. Now we have a Judah who's leading. Now we have a Judah who says, I'm willing to sacrifice everything for this family. It's important for us to notice that because something is happening here in Judah, and it's something that needs to happen because the line of Judah becomes very important. Why? Because this is Jesus' lineage. Jesus eventually comes from the tribe of Judah. And we'll see more about that later as we continue on. But that's why this is important. Judah is finally acting how he needed to. Being the leader of the family that he needs to be and that his line will be. And it's interesting that Jacob agrees. He wouldn't agree with Reuben, but he does agree with Judah. Now, I don't know if it's because Judah was convincing. It probably, though, was just because of how crushing the famine was. They were going to die. And so now Jacob says, yes, go. But Jacob doesn't just say go. Jacob has a plan, doesn't he? He says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take some choice things from the land. He gives them a list. He also tells them to take double the money that they took before take it. Maybe it was just an oversight. And what we see is we see him, we finally see Jacob being a dad. He's taking care of the family. He's, he's worried about his kids and he's hoping that these acts of kindness would some way show some integrity or so show something about the family that says we didn't steal this money. We didn't steal this food. It was a misunderstanding. And here we want you to see this because Jacob knows the fate of his family lies at the hands of this governor in Egypt. The whole fate of his family is in this man's hand. And so Jacob sends them off with this plan, but not just a plan. He also sends them off with a prayer in verse 14. Because in verse 14, he says, May God Almighty grant you mercy before the man. And may he then send you back with your brothers. This is a prayer. And we finally see Jacob referencing God. And he references God in a very specific way. He says, God Almighty this is El Shaddai. This is, this is the God of, of might, of, of power. What, what Jacob is doing is he is telling them about the God who made a covenant with him. This is our covenantal God, and may, may he be the one to grant mercy, because it's not up to the governor if you get mercy. It's up to God if you get mercy. Jacob is, is recognizing that, and he's telling this to his boys. We want this man to show you mercy, but we know in the end it's God who has to do this. It's God who has to move, and so he's reminding them of this God who made a covenant with him and with his father and with the grandfather, Abraham, saying, may he give us mercy. And he appeals to God. And in a way, he's reminding Judah and those who are in the room at this time, remember, it's only God who gives mercy. God gives the mercy. So in this, don't we, we see that Jacob finally understands the reality of the situation. And he says at the end, if I'm bereaved, I'm bereaved. That's a broken man, isn't it? At that point, he's broken. He's broken. Fine, if I'm bereaved, then I have to be bereaved. We don't say things like that. We don't want that in our life. But finally, God is getting Jacob where he needs to be. And he's finally acting how he should. And I think that's why they, his name is Israel in this chapter. Jacob is finally acting like he should. So let's continue on, verses 16 to 25. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the servant of his house, bring the men into the house and slaughter an animal and make ready, for the men are to dine with me at noon. The man did as Joseph told him and brought the men to Joseph's house. And the men were afraid because they were brought to Joseph's house. And they said, it is because of the money which was replaced in our sacks the first time that we are brought in so that he may assault us and fall upon us to make us servants and seize our donkeys. So they went up to the steward of Joseph's house and spoke with him at the door of the house and said, 
Oh, my Lord, we came down the first time to buy food. And when we came to the lodging place, we opened our sacks, and there was each man's money in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight. So we have brought it again with us, and we have brought other money down with us to buy food. We do not know who put our money in our sacks. He replied, Peace to you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has put treasure in your sacks for you. I received your money. Then he brought Simeon out to them. And when the man had brought the men into Joseph's house and given them water and they had washed their feet, and when he had given their donkeys fodder, they prepared the present for Joseph's coming at noon, for they heard that they should eat bread there. So here we see the brothers returning to Egypt, and right away Joseph sees his brother and he sees Benjamin. He sees that Benjamin is with them. And so Joseph immediately goes off to the side. He goes off to the people in his home and he tells them, make plans. These men are going to eat with me today. So go, we're going to have a party. We're going to have a meal. And so the brothers are brought in to Joseph's house. And what happens? Fear. <laughs> Great fear overcomes them because they do not know what is going to happen. They do not know what's going to take place. They are positive that they're being brought into this house because they think they stole the money. And it's interesting what they say. They say, he's bringing us into the house. Why? To seize our donkeys. It does show kind of how foolish these guys are. Do they really think Joseph needs their donkeys? Their little worn out donkeys? I mean, he's over all of Egypt. He just wants our donkeys. He doesn't want your donkeys. He doesn't need your donkeys. Right? But that's what they think. And that's the fear that overcomes them here. And so the brothers then are trying to get out of the situation. And so what do they do? They're going to go to the steward of the house. They go to the steward of the house. They tell him everything that happened, everything that took place. And they're trying to tell him, we did not steal this. Again, we can't put ourselves in this situation, but we try to. Such a horrible spot to be in in verse 22. Looking at that steward, being like, listen, we didn't take the money. But knowing this guy's just got to take their word. And not knowing what's going to happen. It had to be amazing and extremely refreshing for verse 23 to happen in their life. What they hear is the greeting and the welcome that they would have shared at home many, many times. Peace. That's what they said in Israel to each other. Peace. Shalom. Right? Peace be with you. You have this Egyptian man giving them the greeting of peace that they would have said so many times up to this point in their life. And they hear, they hear him say, peace be with you. And what does the steward assure them? He says, it's interesting. He says, I received your money. Do you notice that? He, he said that after he says, God has blessed you. He says, peace to you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father, which we'll get back to, has put the treasure in your sacks for you. But notice what he says. I received your money. He tells them, you need to know I received your money. But the reason you got your money back was a gift from your God and the God of your father. I don't know how these brothers weren't so confused at this point. How do you guys know my God? How do you know the God of my father? But yet these are the exact words that he is using. I wonder if their mind went back to the prayer of their dad. May God Almighty grant you mercy. And at this moment, that's happening. From a steward, an Egyptian steward. He's saying, your God gave that back to you. He put the treasure back in your sack. sack. Don't worry. God is taking care of you. That's what this foreigner is telling them. And he says, God has given you this mercy. And so in a moment, all of this fear and all of this worry ends. It just simply ends and it goes away. And Almighty God, El Shaddai, has taken care of them. It's taken care of them perfectly. And so here God is not only giving them mercy, but he's also providing for them all of their needs. So not just mercy, but we see great provision happening. And God blessing these brothers. So let's continue on and let's see how this chapter ends. It says in verse 26, When Joseph came home, they brought into the house to him the present that they had with them and bowed down to him to the ground. 
And he inquired about their welfare and said, Is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? They said, Your servant, our father, is well. He is still alive. And they bowed their heads and prostrated themselves. And he lifted up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? God be gracious to you, my son. Then Joseph hurried out, for his compassion grew warm for his brother, and he sought a place to weep. And he entered his chamber and wept there. Then he washed his face and came out, and controlling himself, he said, Serve the food. They served him by himself, and them by themselves, and the Egyptians who ate with them by themselves, because the Egyptians could not eat with the Hebrews, for that is an abomination to the Egyptians. And they sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked at one another in amazement. Portions were taken to them from Joseph's table, but Benjamin's portion was five times as much as any of theirs. And they drank and were merry with him. So when Joseph arrives home, the first thing they do is bow down to him. They present gifts to him that they had brought, that their dad had told them to bring. And as they bow down, Joseph inquires of them about his dad. They say, is your father still alive? And notice how they respond in verse 28. They say, our father, your servant, is still alive. And then what did they do? They bowed down again. Now this is the fulfillment of the second dream. This is Joseph's second dream. Remember when not just the brothers would bow down to him, but the whole family. Remember at that dream, Jacob was like, ah, be quiet. But here it is. The whole family submitting to Joseph and bowing down to Joseph. They say, your servant is still alive. Joseph then sees Benjamin. And once again, he's overcome with so much emotion. But notice how he speaks to Benjamin. Once again, God is mentioned in this chapter. And now it's coming from the Egyptian ruler. And when he speaks to Benjamin, what does he say? He asks for God to give grace to Benjamin. And so in the picture that we have so far in this story is we have a God of mercy, a God of provision, and the God of grace. And Joseph is saying, let God pour his grace out on you, Benjamin. But after saying this, he's... He's so moved with emotion, he's got to leave the room. He's got to, he's got to go away because people would wonder what is going on. And so he, he leaves the room and he, and he weeps. And he weeps for his brother and with everything that is happening. But then when he gets back, the party starts. Joseph says, serve the food. And so they start to serve the food. They do it according to Egyptian custom, we are told. This is all separate. Joseph by himself, because he is the, loot, the leader, the Egyptians off by themselves because it is abomination for them to eat with the Hebrews. And then the brothers are sat down how they are supposed to sit and they are served their food. And interestingly enough, again, this is something easy to pass over. They are placed exactly in order of birth. And this isn't just by accident because afterwards it says the brothers notice this and they're like, how did they, how did they know how to sit us? There has to be questions going on in their mind. These Egyptians keep talking about our God. This guy seems to know a lot about our family because now we are sitting exactly how we were born. But they're not thinking about it too deep because all of a sudden there's food and drink there and they're like, let's get into this. And so the Bible tells us they have a great time, doesn't it? It says they, are, they drink and they are merry with him and they are eating. But there still is another test. Joseph is still giving another test to these brothers because the Bible tells us here that Joseph gives Benjamin five times the amount of food than he does the other brothers. Now, I was listening to a sermon, and the guy was right. He's like, this had to be weird for Benjamin. Like, whoa, slow down. I can't, I can't eat all this food. You know, five times of what everybody else is just pouring onto his plate. But there's a test, isn't it? Are the brothers going to act like they did with Joseph? When Joseph got the coat... When it was obvious that Joseph was the favorite, were they going to do the same to Benjamin or had things changed? Has their heart changed? Is there a difference in their life? And it seems as if there's a difference. Because even after seeing all the portions handed out, they don't complain about the portions. They don't say, why is he getting the better cut? 
Why is he getting more? That's not what's said. No, instead they sit and they have a good time together. A party takes place. So it does end a lot better than last time, right? It ends with something satisfying for us to see. We think, man, finally we're turning a corner here in the story. Finally, we're getting maybe to some good news that is happening and that is taking place. And that is, that is true. And I think there's some things for us to see in this chapter, and I want to go through it uh, quickly for us this morning. Really just three things. The first thing is this. Like Jacob, we want to think that we are in control of our life. You want to think that you can control every aspect of your life, but you need to recognize, just like Jacob, just like Jacob, you need to recognize you don't control your life. Again, we like to have our hands on this. I was listening to a sermon by a pastor. His name's Edward Donnelly, Irish guy. And he pointed out, he pointed out three things in this, in this passage that I thought were very helpful for this, for this thought. He says there's three things in this passage that, are just, that just show us that we are not in control. Number one is natural things. A famine was taking place. This is natural. This happens all around the world. And Jacob had no control of this famine. It was just a natural thing, just like us today. We have natural things happen all over our country. Tornadoes, hurricanes, earthquakes, flooding. There's all kinds of things that happen. And, and what it's supposed to point us to, what it should point us to, is just the simple fact that you're not in control like you think you are. Now, if you listen to the narrative, though, that's taking place in our day and age, what is it telling us? That it's actually our fault the natural things are taking place, that we can control it. If your cars were a little better, if our factories were a little better, right? If, if we didn't have as many cows, all these different things. Now, I'm not saying that doesn't play a factor into stuff. I don't know. I'm not a scientist. That's not my job this morning. But it's almost like we just want to push away the fact that you're not in control. We're not in control. And it's just stuff that's natural. But there's a second thing that we're not in control of, and it's people. Jacob had no control over what the Egyptians were going to do. He could try to set it up and send gifts and send extra money. He could do all these things and think, this is going to work. But even Jacob finally realized, I don't know if it's going to work. And it's the same with you in your life. You cannot control the people in your life. Parents, you should know this very well. You try to control your kids. You can't. You can't control them. You try to make sure that they're by you at all times so you can control them. I got to tell you, as soon as you turn your back, you want to know what they do? What you told them not to do. All of them. Every single one of them. Every single one of them. Even the good kids. Even the good kids are bad. I give all these kids suckers. I have them in my office. They all know it. You want to know what I find every Sunday after all of you leave? Gross sucker sticks all over the floor. Everywhere. Everywhere. You want to know why? Your kids are bad. That's why. And you're not as good at controlling them as you think you are. You're just not. It's the same with the people you work with. It's the same with your friends. You might think that you can manipulate them, that you can get them to change or whatever the case might be. This is, this is why God gives us a command in Scripture to not marry a non-Christian. He says, if you're a Christian, you should never marry a non-Christian. And a lot of people look at that and think, why? This is why. You're not going to change them. Now, don't get me wrong. Over history, that has happened before. A non-Christian marries a Christian, and eventually that non-Christian comes to know the Lord. I'm not saying that doesn't happen. It does. You want to know why? Because God is a God of mercy, of grace, of kindness. But God is trying to protect his children when he says, don't marry a non-Christian because you might think you can change them. You can't change people. They're out of your control. Just go for a drive today. I dare you. Go for a drive on 23. And I want you to drive right through Ann Arbor. I want you to hit M14. And then I want you to get back on 23. And I want you to tell me if you can control people. You can't. You have no idea what they're going to do in that car. 
They, they say they have a license. No way. But we like to think we have it. There's a third one, though, in this passage. And it's just simply circumstances. It's just simply circumstances. Joseph asked the brothers questions that led to situations and circumstances at home. And remember, Jacob was like, why did you tell him about this? He tried to put this blame just on, on circumstances. And it's like, I, Judah was like, it was out of my control. There was nothing I could do. What did you want me to say? I'm not speaking to you. You want me to tell that to the guy in charge of Egypt? No, I will not answer. Then we would have all been dead. It's just, dad, it's just life. It's circumstances. It's things we find, and we, we just find ourselves in situations. And isn't that true? How many of you today are exactly where you thought you would be? Some of you are way better off than you thought you would be. Some of you are a little worse off than you thought you would be. And the fact is, you can go through your life and you can pinpoint and look at all these different things that you could have done better, and that's true. We should, we should look at that. But circumstances happen. I have the privilege every week to stand and look at your guys' faces. And the fact is, I know a lot of your guys' situations. And some of you and your families have just put in circumstances you never expected. You never expected to leave a doctor's office and to be told you have cancer. Never. You went to the doctor because your stomach hurt or because you had a headache. And you left with your life completely changed. Circumstances. Out of your control. Right? And so you find yourself all of a sudden changing all of your plans because now instead of going to Florida, we're going to doctor's appointments. Right? It's now in, instead of scheduling things with the family, no, we have to set things aside because there's a surgery that has to take place and it's very important. These are circumstances that we just do not have control of. And it would do us well this morning to realize that this is just the case. Life happens, and often it happens quickly. And our head is spinning and we're not sure what to do. We find ourselves in these positions that we don't like, that we didn't want to be in, yet the fact is, here we are. And it needs to tell us, it needs to tell me, Tim, you're not as in control of this thing as you think you are. Our mind needs to be directed that it's God who is in control of life. And what we need to do is we need to have patience. And we need to have trust in God that God is working. I want to remind you, this family now has been suffering for over two decades. Over two decades. For us, it's just a couple weeks of reading. If you read it at home on your own, I mean, it's real quick. You can read the story and you're like, oh, oh, great. Not great for them. Years and years of turmoil, of hurt, of struggle, of almost starvation, of travel, of death, of wonder, all these different things. This is their life. But thankfully, God got them to the place where finally Jacob would say, may God Almighty give mercy to you. And then finally they get to the place to when they talk to the steward and the steward says, your God has shown you mercy and has provided for you. And then they get to hear from Joseph, who they don't know as Joseph. May God give you grace. All of a sudden, this family finds God working. And it's a reminder to us to be patient and to trust that God is working in our lives. And oftentimes, he works through the difficulty. Not the great things. But the difficult things and the hard things is when he's molding us and when he's making us into the image of his son. Well, then secondly, and the last two go together. Here we see a family who lived in the unknown. They didn't know what was going to happen, but yet, as we said, they were shown mercy. They were shown provision. And they were shown grace. But all of this was unknown that it was going to happen. There was, there was really no way for this family to know that when they got to Egypt, it would take place. That it would all fall perfectly for them. They, they didn't know this. In their mind, there was a decent chance that when they got there, they were going to take Benjamin and keep him. They would just kill him all. They would enslave him. They really had no idea. And so this trip from home to Egypt must have been excruciating extremely long just simply because of the unknown. I don't know about you. I hate the unknown. I hate that. And I have to, I've heard that from you guys before too. Some of you families 
who are going through that stuff medically, you love my chart. We talked about that before because you think you're going to know faster. So you keep eating refresh, 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 refresh. Why are you doing that? The unknown. It's like, I just want to know. I want to know what's going on and then we'll deal with it. That walk to Egypt had to take forever because they didn't know what was going to happen when they walked in. Yet in this story, God is credited with giving them mercy, provision, and grace. And what these men experienced was the absolute best outcome they could have thought of. And the only reason it happened was because of God. That's the only reason. It had nothing to do with the double money. Ain't that interesting? It had nothing to do with the gold, the myrrh. Oh, you want some pistachios? Nothing to do with the pistachios. None of that. Didn't have to do with their donkeys. The steward was like, <laughs> can you imagine the steward receiving these things? Like, mm -mm. God gave you that. Your God fed you. Your God gave you your money. It's your God who did all of this. Yeah, I received it. The steward recognized that. I received it. I put it in your sack. But it wasn't me. It was God who did all of that for you. But the brothers didn't know that this was going to take place, yet they had the privilege of seeing God work and moving in such a mighty way for them and for their family. And yes, it took a long time, but God is finally changing them. And how is he doing it? He's doing it with his unending covenantal love. They're being reminded of that, even in the name, El Shaddai, this covenantal love that God had promised. He hasn't left us. He hasn't forsaked us. Here he is answering these prayers that we've had. He's doing it, finally. And we see this the most in Judah. God, it seems, had finally completely melted his heart to be the person he needed to be. And we'll see that even more in the coming chapters. Judah was the man that God wanted, willing to lay his life down for his family. Right? This is the same guy who just a few chapters ago, remember, left his family, went with, a, went with a foreigner, his best friend, went into a foreign land and just had a good time. Wives, kids, all kinds of stuff. Now it's this guy who says, I'll die for this family. Put me on the line. I'm willing to do it. God has changed Judah's heart and we see it in his willingness to lead, his willingness to step forward for the salvation of his family. You see, our third point is connected to that second one, and here, here's what it is. You and I, we don't live in the unknown. Those brothers lived in the unknown. They didn't know if there was going to be a Savior for them. They didn't know if salvation was coming. But today, you and I have the privilege of living in the known. We know that there is one who has been given for us, Jesus, who has shown us mercy, who gives us grace, and has promised to provide for us all we need. I can, I can give you that promise this morning and say, here it is. You don't have to leave wondering if it'll happen. No, the Bible tells us it is a guarantee. We have the privilege of knowing that God has provided for us completely through the tribe of Judah, through the man Jesus Christ, who freely gives us mercy, grace, and provisions. <laughs> you don't have to come this morning like the brothers and be like, well, here it is. Here's, here's all the good things I did this week. Is Jesus happy with me? Am I going to be able to keep going next week? You don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. <laughs> Your piddly little things. That's like the pistachio nuts. You think Jesus needs your pistachio nuts? No. He doesn't need your little good works. No, no, no. He says, I've provided all this for you. Don't worry. No, 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 no. Don't worry about it. Here's the offer. Mercy. Grace. Provision. And it's all yours in the man Christ Jesus. In John chapter 5, verse 20 through 2 through 24, Jesus is speaking and he says, For the Father judges no one. But has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, 
but has passed from death to life. This is the guarantee. This is the surety. Remember, Judah said, I put my life on the line for Benjamin. I promise you, Dad, he will come home. This is what Jesus has done for you. And this is the offer he's given you this morning. I have put my life on the line for you. In fact, I went all the way to death. I got put in the grave. But I conquered death, hell, and the grave for you. And if you would believe, it said there in John. If you would believe in me and him who sent me, what does it say? You will have eternal life. No ifs, ands, or buts. No unknowing. No, no wondering. No, no questions asked. Me and Spencer were talking this week, and it's sad. There are so many denominations who teach their people, who sit in their pews, and maybe you're one this morning and you're feeling this way. They come in and wonder every day, am I a Christian? We don't have to ask that question. Do you believe in Jesus and do you believe in the one who sent him? If you do, you have eternal life. That's the guarantee. That's a hope that is known. That is a promise that drives away all fear, all wonder. So now, if that is you, and if you are a Christian this morning, you can live your life knowing. You're not in the dark. You're not confused about tornadoes and hurricanes and in wars and pestilence. You're not confused about all of that stuff. Why? Because you know we live in a sinful world that hurts. It's not confusing to you. You might wonder, God, why haven't you sent Jesus back yet? Yeah, we pray for that. Lord, come. Please come. But we're not confused about why all this is happening. We're saying, of course it's happening. But we have the good news to share with this world that's so confused. Don't we? That there is a surety there is a promise, and it is given to us in the man Christ Jesus. I want to end this morning re reading Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5 is a beautiful chapter. And it again points to the surety of Christ. So I want you to listen to this chapter. It won't take me long to read it. To let it sink in. To hold on to it with hope. A hope that is secure and fast. But in Revelation chapter 5, John writes for us, and he says, Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly. Because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. This is the unknown. John's describing to us the unknown. This has to be open. Who's going to open it? We have no hope. We have no hope. And so he's weeping. Verse 5. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and the, among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns, with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he, he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp, golden bowls of, full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. 
And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and they worshiped. This is the known. John paints for us a beautiful picture here of the vision that he had in heaven. Who's going to open it? You might be living your life that way. Who's in control of this thing? I'm trying to be in control of this thing, but you realize I'm not in control of this thing. I try to control it, but it just seems to be impossible. It is impossible. You're trying to take the scroll, and you're trying to open it. That's what you're doing in your life. You're trying to open the scroll, and what John is saying it was when, when they looked upon heaven and they looked earth and they looked at everything, what did they say? They said, there's nobody here who can open it. That's you. That's me. We can't open the scroll. But then thankfully, one of the elders steps up and he says, look. Look. There's somebody able to open it. All hell is not let loose here, is what he's saying. There's somebody here to control it. And it's not a figure like you and I would think, some stately man, some strong, proud guy, some good orator who might be able to get across things. No, what does he say? He has such a pitiful description of this Savior. It's like a lamb. But it's kind of like it's dead, but it's standing. It's slain, but it's standing. But he did that to redeem his people. There he is. He takes the scroll. He opens the scroll. And when that happens, what happens? All of heaven and earth bow before him and praise his name. This is much greater than Joseph. This is much greater than Judah. Oh, their family was happy for them. This is the whole heavens and the whole earth bowing before King Jesus. Who died for you. Who died for me. The only one who can do that. Nothing else in this world, nothing else on this earth can satisfy that. Only Christ has done it. And he's done it so it can be a sure thing in your life. If you will believe in him. In him who sent him. That's what it says. This morning, from this simple little passage of Genesis chapter 43, I really hope and pray that God's opened your eyes, your hearts to the truth. For you, Christian, you've been saved a long time. I hope you get excited again when you read something like Revelation chapter 5. I'm not the biggest crier in the world, but that's a hard chapter for me to read without crying a little bit. Because I know what it feels like to feel hopeless, don't you? I know those moments in life when you're looking at the bills, you're looking at whatever, and you're just like, what in the world am I going to do? You know what that feels like. But to live a life without a Savior is way, way worse than any of that. And you and I have been promised we don't have to live that way. Christ has died for us. And so this morning, I hope that you are able to praise him. I hope that when we sing this song at the end, if you're a Christian this morning, that you'll praise him again, fresh and new. Being reminded of what he has done for you and cemented for you. Church service should really be like the end of Genesis chapter 3. You know, they ate, they drank, they were merry together. We're reminded of that when we come in this place and we hear the gospel preached. As Christians, this is who we are. We're people who will one day get to sit with our Savior, eat, drink, and be merry for eternity. Simply because of his mercy, his grace, and his promise to provide. Let's bow together this morning. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the truth of your word this morning. God, we're humbled that you would allow us to know you, that you would allow us to sing songs to you, that you would allow us to be called your children, but yet that is what you have done. God, after last week, thinking about guilt and being crushed by our sin like those brothers were, to see them being brought up now to such an amazing spot in their life to where they are literally having a party with the most powerful person in the world. There they find themselves Worried they were going to die. Worried everything would be lost. No, now their brother is back. Now they're all together. God, we know that you have provided that for us in Jesus. And we thank you. God, I pray that no one would leave this room without trusting in Christ. God, for those of us who've been saved for a while, God, we want to praise you fresh and new each and every day. Being reminded of your goodness to us. What you've done for us through Jesus. God, we long for the day of Christ to return to when we can dine and sup with him.
forever, where there's no more tears, no more hurt, no more of those natural disasters or anything like that. No. Perfection with him forever. God, we long for that day. But until that day occurs, we do know that our hope is secured, that that day will come. And so, God, I pray that you would help us to live in that light with a surety, with a hope that cannot be wavered. And God, help us to be faithful, to share that promise and that hope with others, not in a condescending way, not in a hateful way, but God, in a loving and kind way, helping them to see that in a world where there seems to be no hope, there is one hope. And it's that Jesus came to die on a cross for sinners. God, as we get ready to sing this last song, help us to worship you well. We want to honor you with everything we say and do, and so we hope and pray that we've done that. Help us as we sing now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Let's sing together.
salvation. Let's bow together, let's pray, and then we'll be dismissed, sorry. God, we thank you that you are our hope, you are our salvation, you are our rock. God, as we leave this place, we do, of course, ask that you watch over us, keep us safe. As we go about our daily tasks, God, I know some of us, maybe many, were raising their hand that they were getting together. God, I pray that they would have a good time. They would be reminded that you are the God who gives good gifts. Even those things of getting together with family and friends, it would draw us to praise you even more. God, as you watch over us this week, do help us to be bold for the sake of the gospel. Help us to rest in the gospel, to rest in Jesus Christ, his accomplished work for us. God, we love you. We praise you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless.